So I'm very pleased to have Dr. Gavin Ashenden on video today and in the show. And he was previously a bishop in the Anglican Church. Also, he was a chaplain to the Queen up until the year 2017. And not too long ago, he converted over to the Roman Catholic faith as a, a layperson in 2019. And also, um, Dr. Ashenden is very much involved in being a well-known commentator, and he, he actually is on YouTube quite a bit. And Dr. Ashenden, I'd like to start with that. Where can people find your work? Well, they <laughs> just Google my name. Uh, they'll find it uh, on, on YouTube is becoming increasingly the platform where most things happen, I think. Um, but I have a, a web page as well, and, um, and and I write for the Catholic Herald in the UK. So uh, just a quick Google will take them to to much of my stuff. But if they subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, or to my web page, then they'll 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 get notifications when the next piece of excitement is published. So what I'll do is I'll put some links to facilitate my audience looking for your work, and you. I'll post those in the comments. So what I'd like to start with is the journey that you experienced as you went from Anglicanism to Roman Catholicism, especially considering your position as a bishop, and that must have been a, a one that was very arduous for you to consider. Well, certainly becoming a Roman Catholic <clears throat> meant giving up my whole adult life. Um, uh, even in terms of a, of a vocation, I saw myself, I, I trained originally as a lawyer as a young man. I <clears throat> then had an evangelical conversion, became uh, an Anglican clergyman, uh, and was ordained for, uh, I think I was ordained in 1980. So, um, uh, so that's 39 years before I became a Roman Catholic. So 39 years of, of investing your life in what you believe in is quite a long time to, uh, I was going to say quite a lot to give up, but but of course it's it. I, I was very happy to give it up because um, I I've often thought of my life in terms of the miracle in St John's Gospel of the man born blind. And he requires two miracles to get him to perfect sight again, and I think that's how I, I've seen my life. I, the first miracle was wonderful. I knew and loved Jesus and served him perfectly in the Protestant Church, uh, and the second miracle was coming home to Rome and um, I'm. Just, so sorry, it was such a long time between the first and the second. But on the other hand, it allowed me to gain some experience, and and um, uh, during which, for example, I I did some postgraduate psychology work with the Jesuits at London University, and so I got to know a certain kind of Catholicism very well in that context. Um, and uh, but I think, like everyone on the outside of the church, my understanding of what Catholicism was was very badly distorted. By, by ignorance, um, by a certain spiritual lacuna, uh, I, I'm quite convinced that the main driving element in whether you're a Catholic or not, and what kind of Catholic you are, is part of the metaphysical struggle. So we can't deal with everything historically and intellectually. We we have to use an element of discernment of spirits to understand what's going on. So it took me quite a long time. Um, to get there, and Our Lady was absolutely very instrumental. Um, uh, well, Our Lady and and the enemy, really, the the enemy. Uh, perhaps to put it as, as simplest, I I began with a, a, a charismatic evangelical experience, and was very badly attacked by the devil in my first years as a Christian disciple, um, quite vividly so. And I'm rather ashamed at the fact that I I became a Jungian liberal. I had no right to do that, but one of the reasons was that it was increasingly difficult for me to tell the difference between uh, psychological woundedness uh, in our society and and evil. And there came a point where I gave up. Um, it's it's difficult. I mean, a lot of people give up by uh, by, by laughing at evil and and imagining it's the providence the, the provenance of fundamentalism or obscura obscurantists and other people give up by laughing at psychology and assuming that there's nothing we can reasonably know about the human condition from the sciences 
Um, but but both are untrue. We have to have we have to have both together. However, it's an immensely difficult struggle. So I gave up. I, I became a Jungian, um, and uh, I was a an academic. I was a professor of psychology for twenty five years uh, at a university, which I, I ran an ecumenical team. And um, I used to go to Teze every year for twenty years. I took an ecumenical group of students and faculty to Teze. But again, Teze is not a great. It, well, it, it's we we could come back to that, but. None of this, um, none of this cleared my vision as to what the Catholic Church was. I think probably I, I have to, I have to allow that it was Our Lady's influence that, that did that. But the way back was a re-encounter with evil, and then not being able to manage this evil. So a friend of mine who was a, a, a Roman Catholic diocesan exorcist said, "Well, you, you really need Our Lady." And so, so, so serious were the difficulties I was encountering. I turned to the Rosary, and then when I discovered Our Lady in the power of the Rosary, well, that that opened the way up um, to the to the to my journey home. So there's there's nothing like an encounter with the demonic to put you on your toes. <laughs> right, so, sorry <laughs> to say, it's true. Yeah. So, could you elaborate upon your relationship or how you found our, our Blessed Mother in, in this journey? Yes, I mean, I remember. I remember I had a very good Greek Orthodox uh, friend, and um, there were two things she contributed to my to my thinking. One was um, the reminder from the Orthodox aphorism that our real struggle is to stand before the real God with the real self, with the mind in the heart. And she and I used to argue. I was an academic, and so I didn't like the idea of the mind giving up its claim to precedence as our, if you like, our main instrumentation, our main na navigation panel. Um, but she, she, through our conversations, I, I, I slowly came round to realise the theological centrality of the heart first. That was quite important because otherwise, if you subject everything to a kind of enlightenment rationality, mo most people in our, in our, I was going to say our civilization, what's left of it, uh, outside the Catholic Church, have been formed by Enlightenment criteria, and essentially, if you can't measure it or prove it, it, it doesn't exist. And then, on the other side of that, there's been a lot of pejorative criticism, suggesting that spiritual reality, metaphysical reality, is 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 a construct. So it's quite a jump to place the heart before the mind. But the next thing is, she said, you know, you know, you you have Jesus as your savior, and you have God as your father, but but you you don't have Our Lady as your mother. And I didn't really understand this. If you if you don't have Our Lady as your mother, you you don't understand. It's it's very hard to believe in something you haven't experienced, even have a concept of it. Uh, and I think that, um, and and so it was through it was through the practice of praying the Rosary as a strategy of managing the demonic, and it managed it very well. That I I, I mean I think I. I, I, how do you explain falling in love with Our Lady when you can't see her? Somehow you get to know her. Well, it's in the heart again, isn't it, rather than the mind? And there's a meeting of hearts, um, and, and all all within the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, but as I as I practiced praying the Rosary, and as I, I think as I entered into a new dimension of a relationship with the Holy Trinity, um, so she became more real. The great thing about becoming a Roman Catholic was that as an Anglican, you had to keep on apologizing for her. Uh, mm -hmm. It always looked like a kind of uh, a sophisticated sort of aspirational add-on that Anglo-Catholics um, specialized in. So one of our herit common heritage that all of us have is that we've all agreed, prior to any sort of schism or separation, that our Blessed Mother was the Mother of God. That was a dogma that we all agreed upon. But for some reason, that is problematic today. And it's very uh, interesting as to why the Council of Ephesus, the, the, the proclamation of Theotokos, um, should have got completely lost in the Reformation. And I, again, I, I can't find any better explanation for it than, than a spiritual assault. She's so important when it comes to, um, uh, to, to demoralizing the demonic, because, of course, as I understand it, and maybe your listeners may well be have a, a far more profound understanding than I do, that um, 
that the the assumption in the spiritual world is that Eve's corruption has given this great success to the whole school of perversion. Um, and, and, our, and our Lord as the eternal Logos, well, following Anselm, he, 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 he blindsided the enemy. But Our Lady is a woman, fully human, and the idea that she could, could rebuff the great triumph that the seduction of Eve represented is a terrible rebuke to the pride of uh, of the enemy and it's this rebuke that they hate so much um and, and of course our lady becomes our mother and not all of us have there isn't a perfect symmetry in the christian narrative uh it's not a kind of dualism between god the father and our lady the mother but god is our ultimate father our lady comes in as a kind of an adopted mother for all of us because Again, many of us have not had very good mothers. God bless them for all they did for us in particularly giving birth and protecting us. But but we need a mother and the church needs a mother. And I think as we pray the rosary and, and things happen in the spiritual world because we pray the rosary, we begin to feel the effects of our mother and know her love and let me say potency rather than power. So it's it's only it's it's in the engagement in the spiritual struggle, uh, and finding ourselves enfolded in her love and practicing it by praying the rosary that something that might have otherwise been theoretical becomes real. But you were raising the question as to why it's so difficult in the Reformation, and I think what I was trying to get round to was that the, the demons really don't want us to have a relationship with her. And one of the things I've been so surprised at. So let's 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 say that. If you're trying to work out what the problem is you're dealing with is, if, if it's capable of a rational interpretation, rational description, a rational prescription, then it's a rational problem. But there are many things that we deal with where you begin to, to look at, analyze it rationally and suddenly it stops. It, it, it is defeated by rationality. I think that's the moment when we're entitled to pray for discernment. And it seems to me there is no rational answer to the Protestant rage with Mary the almost deliberate understanding. And therefore, I'm afraid I see um, the enemy gets into all kinds of things. And one of the ways he's got into the deformation or the protesters is to is to um, act as a cataract as to who Our Lady is. They genuinely can't see her, but they get unusually angry. Instead of saying, well, this is, an, this is a bolt-on you shouldn't be bothering with, uh, go to Jesus and, you know, we, we're not worried about Mary, but just leave her alone. Quite the opposite. They get very, very angry, and oh, yes. it's, it, it's in the it's in the force of that anger. I think that we sense the muscle of the demonic, and that's why it's almost there's almost no point in arguing about her theologically. One has to pray against the influence of the deceiver, uh, because in the yeah. end, it's only as that influence wanes that some kind of clarity of relationship can be had with her. And she's still she's clearly scriptural as well but of yet course. she's still rejected i mean genesis yes, 315 it's not, it's not rational <laughs> yeah and revelations 12 1 woman clothed in the sun yeah or genesis as i mentioned that's a role that's been given to her by heaven so that's the will of god that's her role to defeat satan in the end to crush his head crush the head of the serpent as depicted in genesis 315 and also well, at the cross Absolutely. But one of the ones that evangelicals ought to access most easily, but they still don't, is the wedding at Cana. Uh, and, and, you know, when was our Lord's ministry going to begin? It, it was always going to be a matter of some um, uh, some complexity. And it begins when she says it begins. And it begins with this incredible miracle in which so much of, of, the, of the New Testament and salvific imagery is there. And it's because she says, ready, steady, go. Um, and and you would have thought that that anyone coming to the Bible with an open heart and an open mind would say, well, gosh, the influence of this woman at this particular point is very striking. Maybe I should learn more about her theologically. Uh, and, and, you know, even church history telling us that that she was, 
you know, having been given to John uh, and John given to her after crucifixion. You know, maybe what happened at Ephesus after the resurrection is worth noting historically. Uh, and then, of course, there are all kinds of other things like the discovery of the house at Ephesus as we find history beginning to kind of unpeel like an onion. So the whole thing it make, makes a great deal of sense. It holds up together historically, theologically, in terms of New Testament, uh, the reading of the New Testament. But still, there's this there's this blinding that takes place. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Canaan, so the wedding in Canaan. So that was, um, in modern parlance, basically what was said is, our Lord said, this is not my time, and our Blessed Mother says, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I discovered I was doing some some Bible study recently, and uh, I have fairly basic Hebrew, but but essentially the the Aramaic that lies behind the Greek is a, it's it's a Hebrew phrase. It's traded to person twice in the Old Testament, and it's it's a sort of what is this to thee and to thee and me is the is the literal translation of the phrase, which doesn't translate into English or American at all in any useful way. Um, but it's but it's a phrase. It's quite clearly a sort of stock phrase that was used when a moment of crisis came between between two people who were engaged in a joint project, perhaps on on different sides of it. I think it's used between Ahab and Elijah, for example. But but it's so it's it's clearly a kind of you know just like any of the stock phrases we use. What is this to thee and me? Basically, here we have a crisis. We're not altogether sure we're on the same page. So what's going to happen now? And our lady simply says, "Do what he tells you." She knows it's sorted out. Again, this extraordinary authority and confidence that she has in this matter with her son suggests that the relationship is more than just the mother coming to a wedding. Yes, and, and her mother continues coming to us. And, as you mentioned, she is our mother, and she's coming to us today, even, in many different Marian apparitions as our mother, Absolutely. warning us well, and asking us to I, yeah. convert and so forth. I'm so sorry, I was interrupting you with, by excitement, oh, okay. with excitement. I mean, that, <laughs> one of the things about we might, one of the things about the apparitions, as you quite rightly say, is they are uh, they're an acting out of the motherly love of Our Lady for us and for the church and they are the most extraordinary phenomena and one once again protestants have no idea many catholics have no real idea but when you look at the historical evidence uh, and again as always it ranges from the inauthentic to the dubious to the authentic and once again the sermon is required to make a distinction of category um, and once again, whenever you have something entirely authentic, the enemy comes in to spoil it, of course, with some kind of deceptive uh, imitation. But uh, the history of the authentic apparitions is is, is really quite, quite wonderful. And once again, Our Lady is turning the, the water of diluted faith into the wine of a more profound love for her son. And that's that's what the apparitions are for. Very well said. So England has a very extensive history with Marian apparitions. The most um, predominant one that I'm aware of is Our Lady of Walsingham. And I was wondering if that had any influence on you as well, since you mentioned Our Lady. Funnily enough, it didn't. I don't know why. I, I'd actually, compared to France, um, where, <laughs> where they're almost every 10, 10 miles, England is poorly served. And the ones I know about are, are Walsingham, of course. Then there was one in the Vale of Evesham, which is a very, very beautiful uh, part of southwest England. I travelled through it as a as a I remember as a student, thinking, "Gosh, what is it? What is it about this part? Of, I've never been such a beautiful part of the country. Why is Evesham so exquisitely beautiful?" And then it was later on I discovered that I think in the eighth or seventh century, Our Lady there was an apparition of Our Lady there to a swineherd. There's another one in St Bartholomew's, a church in the centre of London, um, which took place in the Middle Ages as well. Those are the three well-known ones, and of course, I mean there are plenty we don't know about. Um, and and they're important, but no, uh, I I couldn't make much sense of of the apparitions in England. The one that uh, the one, if you like, that acted as a real catalyst for me. Um, well, there were two, uh, but but there was Zaytun and Garabondal. Mm. And Zaytun was um, very very. <laughs> It, it was unusual in the sense that everyone was there saw our blessed mother and <laughs> absolutely it appeared in in coptic orthodox church and arrestimating 
it was above the church we imagined where where the holy family lived in egypt it's a place yes. in the southern su suburbs of egypt and was, it's where we expected them to be so it would be surprising if it wasn't specifically connected with their stay there but but um it was simply the power of the phenomena it, it converted large numbers of Muslims there were many healings there was nothing spoken as I understand it but Our Lady simply appeared I was the, 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 I was blown away by this because I was visiting it on a pilgrimage almost by accident and I was standing on the uh, on the church uh, on, on the spot and and opposite it uh, a block opposite is is a cathedral and it's modern I mean it's been recently built and our guide said do you know what that is um, and we said well it's astonishing. It's, well, it's, it's a cathedral built in honor of Our Lady, being built. It's not finished yet. And it was built by, by Nasser, the president of Egypt. Now, Nasser was a secularized Muslim, uh, and um, the apparitions took place in the time that he was there. He was so convinced that this was Our Lady that he raised the blocks in front of the church. I mean, they were nationalized, taken over by the government. He knocked down everything, and at the government's expense, began to build a cathedral in honor of Our Lady and the apparitions. Well, for a, for a secular Muslim politician to be so uh, profoundly affected by what happened in his hometown suggests that it was more, as the critics do, than some mass hallucination. You don't get a government doing that with a mass hallucination. Uh, so not only were there were there, were there many miracles and many conversions, um, but you know once again, I mean, it happened when I was fourteen. So the the, the apparitions I wanted to have to, to to see were ones that took place in my lifetime because I was slightly affected by uh, by the fear of hagiograph hagi hagiographical write ups. Uh, you know, as you go back into sort of Eucharistic devotion, you read these astonishingly medieval stories, and you think, can these things possibly be true? As you get closer to them. For example, if you read the biography of St. Martin of Tours uh, by, by his disciple and friend, when you actually read it, you think, my goodness, this is, this is very vivid. He clearly thinks like I do. Um, he appears to be writing literally, not, not figuratively. Can, can these things have happened even half as powerfully as he says? Well, so I thought to get rid of the whole hagiographical lens, I wanted to see these two, two apparitions, one in 1968 and one in Gadabondal, 63, 64, 65, when I was about 10. Uh, and the Gadabondal ones were interesting because, of course, there was video or, or, or film. Mm -hmm. um, and and it was precisely as I was watching this, I thought, well, with access to this film, I, I, I can gain a clearer sense of how authentic this was. And although the, the film that I'd got, somebody had put some ghastly gothic music to it, which was supposed <laughs> to, to you know, amplify it, but it did no good at all. I was I was immensely moved by the film. And I was watching it one day in my faculty office, and a friend of mine came in who uh, was a psychologist. And she said, what are you watching? And I said, well, I'm watching some film of a northern Spanish village where three children purportedly are responding to Our Lady. And of course, you know, as you know, they move in perfect time as she teaches them to cross yes. themselves. And to, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, and you can also see they're absolutely fixed on her. They can't see each other. Uh, and yet they move in perfect time. So how is, how is this possible? Uh, and my friend said, well, whatever that is, I think you can trust what the, chil what the children are saying. What are the children saying? Well, they're, they're saying it's Our Lady and she's coming with a message for the church. And so the reason I think you can trust them is because we've done a number of experiments on prepubescent children of that age, and they're quite incapable of faking ecstasy. There are certain things they've, they've not, there's a repertoire of, of, of fake real imitation that's beyond them biologically or neurologically. Uh, and so, so, so the children that age can't deceive in terms of the phenomena they're experiencing. So you know that 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 gets a very interesting thing to know psychologically, and again, that was one of the things that began to clear away my objections as to what I was might be seeing. So regarding Gary Bondal, anytime someone asks me about ecstasy and what that looks like, I refer them to the film of Gary Bondal. Yeah, that's the, the most obvious example of ecstasy that I can think of, and also it's filmed. And besides uh, what your associate mentioned 
also they were subjected to physical tests as well absolutely they were pricked and pushed and yes and, yes. and, they, and then there's this amazing amazing picture of the host appearing on a on a child's yes. tongue out of nowhere which is again quite phenomenally extraordinary the other thing that's uh, amazing is they couldn't be moved while they were in ecstasy yes, yes that's right so they're very you know thin small young children and two men couldn't move them and that's yeah. also very similar. It's that's p peculiar to ecstasies that people go into. Though it also happened at Kibeho, when our Blessed Mother appeared there, they couldn't move the children, or if the, the children were folding their hands in prayer, they tried to separate their hands. They they could not do that. Mm. So it's very similar. That's a very interesting. I'm glad you you went into the Marian apparitions and Garibandal and Zaitun especially. So Zaitun is seems to be although well, there's no message there, just her appearance seems to be prophetic. And I've noted that it was similar to Nock, although Nock was in one appearance and a very small audience there. I think it was about fifteen people or so. And um Again, there was no message, so it was very similar. But at Zaitun, uh, one of the things I like to point out is that the Muslims actually revere Mary, and Mary's in the Quran more times than she appears in the Bible. <laughs> a lot of people don't, don't know that. Well, but she's well, coming back for her children, and her children are not just the Roman Catholics. Everyone is one of her children as the mother of God. Can I, can I make a theological, can I offer a theological commentary on what, on what you've just said? Because, sure. Uh, uh, what you've said is true, but I think it needs putting in a, in a, a broader context. Um, it's very, it, in one sense, it's very important that Mary's in the Quran because it familiarizes Muslims with somebody other they wouldn't otherwise know about. But the problem with the biblical figures in the Quran is they're not the biblical figures. They have different characters and different roles. Mm -hmm. And so the great danger of, of a Christian saying, but Jesus, Isha, and Miriam, Mary, are in the Quran, as is David and Elijah and Abraham, but actually not in the roles that they play. In other words, what Muhammad did was he borrowed the names, and he, if you like, in, in, in the fiction writing of the Quran, he writes the names in to give the Quran a degree of authenticity, but he gets the character and the roles all wrong, like a rather like a rather bad student, 11 year old student. Um, and the reason this is important is because uh, Allah is not Yahweh. M Mos Moses is not Moses. Abraham is not Abraham. Mm. Miriam is not Mary. Jesus, Isha is not Jesus. And that's a, an excellent point you're making there. And um, you're freezing up a little bit. So or I want to say that that's 100% true, that the Bible was hijacked yeah, and basically used as a vehicle to propose his vision of what religion should be. Exactly so. So there is, there's, you know, as always, God can take something that's been perverted or disordered and use it for good. And the good is that one can say to Muslims, you know, you know, you are familiar with the person of Miriam. Let me introduce you to our, to, to our Lady for real, in the same way that we want to introduce the Isha, Jesus, for real. But the danger with the Quran is that it's a dead end spiritually. It, 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 it doesn't, it won't tell anybody anything about David or Abraham or Mary or Jesus. Yep, I agree 100%. Figures that, yeah. There we are. So, excuse my adding that, but just for the sake of clarity. No, that, that's uh, that's a great uh, clarification. But but I do look at the familiarity that it proposes as being beneficial. Also, very similar Fatima. Also, yeah. there's that familiarity where you have Muslims sometimes go to Fatima. Yes, <laughs> just because of the name. That's the good side of it. Exactly so. So the the name Fatima is a. And it's quite clear that Our Lady wants some kind of bridge into Islam, uh, but it's but I think it's only so there can be one way traffic, which is from Islam into the Gospels, from, absolutely from the Caliphate into the Kingdom, uh, yes. and so you know it it, it it's, but it's of use in a particular specified way. She always calls people back to the sheepfold. Yes. <laughs> so. I have to ask you also about 
I guess the obvious question, and you're, you're probably find it a bit tiresome, you may have answered this quite a bit, but you had an opportunity when you left the Anglican Church, you could have stayed within the clergy. You came to a fork in the ro- road here, and you decided to become a lay person, a Catholic layman. So what prompted that decision on your part? Well, it's all really up to the Holy Spirit. I don't mean to be uh, over pious, but um, you know, all any of us can do is offer each day to God and say, "What? Well, which way would you like me to go? I have my ideas. I, I think you might want this. What do you actually want? And perhaps the biggest difficulty we have is to confuse our own desires with the will of God and then find it difficult to let go of our desires when the parts begin to separate a bit. <laughs> So um, I was, uh, uh, my conversion was made easier by my local Roman Catholic bishop asking to see me and saying, look, I'm reading what you're writing as an Anglican. Uh, and, and I like the fact that your Anglican orders have have got uh, a Catholic provenance. So um, my my con- those who consecrated me were themselves consecrated from uh, a Catholic bishop in 1946 in Buenos Aires. So this was quite important for the legitimization of Anglican orders um, after the event. But uh, but not to be sidetracked, he said, I, I think you, you ought to become fully Catholic and I'd like you to help me in my diocese and I'd like you to help me with a seminary I'm building. Uh, this, was, this was before our, our dear Pope began to, tighten the uh, the rain i'm sorry dr yeah. ashenden we're experiencing a little freeze right okay well, the, well let me go back to uh you're back where should i go back to uh you started talking about tight, tightening the reins fine so so this is before <laughs> our, our our dear uh pope francis began to tighten the reins uh as they are now and um uh and so the invitation was that I would be ordained after about six months of learning some canon law. He thought that I was reasonably proficient in Catholic theology, but I would obviously need to use some, learn some canon law. And then things began to go wrong in a very surprising way. So first of all, uh, first of all, the bishop thought my papers with Rome, but actually they got lost or hidden or something happened, something went wrong with them, uh, and uh, everything stalled. The assumption being that Rome was storing, but Rome knew nothing about them. And then I, it seemed to me right to to uh, ask if I could join the Ordinariat because of the liturgy there. And astonishingly, my papers were sent to Rome all over again, and they went to uh, Vietnam by mistake this time. Mm. Uh, so now twice my papers have got lost. And uh, But during this period, of which took about three or four years, uh, not the six months, um, Things began to develop un- under the present Pope in a way which I'm sure anyone listening will will understand. I mean, you know, w- when the papacy began, it looked it just looked a bit messy, uh, but but the messiness has has become of a darker hue since the early days, and uh, it it became it. Be- it, it as ordination became more possible, it was made clear to me that I wouldn't be allowed to speak in public about public theological matters, that I would be required no. to be silent. Uh, and I, I said, well, as a matter of obedience and humility, that's absolutely fine. But as a matter of discernment of vocation, it may not be so fine. God's given me a platform to talk about the Catholic faith, which I'm really grateful for. And I have to say, people become Catholics every week um, as they follow my YouTube channel. It's really very exciting, quite quite wonderful. <laughs> I mean, I, it's jaw-dropping for me. So I said, if I accept as a matter of humility and obedience this imp- imposition of silence in order to, to be ordained, what happens to this, this apostolate, this vocation? Uh, and so I asked if it was negotiable. Could I be a bit silent, or could we? Could we? And, and the answer was it was completely non-negotiable. And I thought, well, actually, 
God has given me a platform to speak for him and for the Catholic Church at a time when the truth and the, and the, the health and the life of the church are really being very seriously contested. And although it would be, it would be very wonderful for me to be ordained a Catholic priest and above all, to celebrate the Mass as, as I understand it should be properly celebrated, for small communities of Catholics in my locality here on the Welsh borders, uh, that would be nice for me, but I'm not sure it's what God has called me to. Uh, and so I consulted very many of my, my wise friends, and they said, well, no, we we think at the moment the church may be more in need of, of your voice and the opportunities it has than of your sacramental ministry. Um, and I, and so, so I, I declined to be silenced, and they said, well, off you go then. So, <clears throat> and there's also, there's a benefit to it. Um, inevitably, as you become more responsible in the church, some people think, well, you're doing this because you like the titles or the prefixes. You want to be called Monsignor or Your Eminence. Uh, the, you, 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 you enjoy both the clothes and the prominence and the authority. And it seemed to me there was something really wonderfully refreshing about being able to say to the Lord, have it all back. Have it all. It's all yours. Let, let me start at the beginning again. And um, out of love for you, uh, a, a kind of purification of motive, perhaps. So that, that, in, it, you know, that, that in itself is a, is, a, is a blessing of all of its own. And do you think that possibility may still be in your future? Returning. God, well, God, <laughs> I'd very much like it if the Lord as a present found a, a, a bishop who said, uh, we think your orders are ontologically valid and we'll regularize them. That would be, that would be lovely, but um, that's not something that I, if, if I, if I want for that or dream of it or fantasize about it or long for it, it just gets in the way I talked earlier on about humility and obedience, and so one was one was to the church, um, but there's always a humility and obedience that we owe to the Lord first. And so I think the thing is to try and keep the humility and the obedience as clean as possible and just say, well, okay, Lord, let's deal with what we've got today as best we can. And there's something inside me that w wants to refer to you as bishop, but... Um... <laughs> People often call me father, and I don't mind it. I don't, I don't dissuade them from it, um, but but I, you know, but one of the way I, it just takes me back to, uh, well, Lord, you brought me to this place, so let let me. Uh, I mean, there's something about it, there's something canonic about it, isn't it? I mean, our Lord, our Lord sets aside everything to become human in order to become Catholic. I, I set aside my my clerical charisms. Uh, and start at the bottom. And again, I think there's something to be said for, you know, if I if I if <laughs> if I uh, had an ecclesiastical title, uh, there's always the possibility people think, well, you just moved sideways. You didn't, you know, this didn't cost you very much. Whereas, you know, it cost me everything, and that's good. That's absolutely fine. It's it's in a sense, in a sense, it's a guarant, not a guarantor, but it's a. Um, uh, it does something to help increase the confidence in one's integrity because, because you know, that's... Well, that's, I don't want to uh, embarrass you, but I, I believe it's very courageous what you did. It's almost a martyrdom, what you did for the reasons that you did it. Uh, it's all, Everything we do is a response of love to love. So uh, we always get more back than we ever give. I've lost nothing. I've only been immensely blessed. Thank God. So I have a question about your journey to Roman Catholicism. You were chaplain to the Queen for yes, yes. approximately nine years, and yes. not that long ago, 2017. So in 2017, did your journey to Catholicism reveal itself somehow where that became untenable as being a chaplain? What? No, what happened was... <clears throat> um, uh, I think my journey to Catholicism, like many Anglicans, began a lot longer. I mean, I would say it began when I was a child. I was a boy at a, I was sent away to a cathedral school at Canterbury. Uh, and, and so, you know, Canterbury Cathedral is a Catholic building. Uh, I, I was brought up between the ages of 12 and 18 uh, in the shadow of one of the greatest Catholic buildings in England. Uh, and 
I thought of it at the time as a Christian building, but I now realise it was a it was a Catholic building. Anglicans don't understand cathedrals. They don't even understand Catholic churches. They use them in a utilitarian sense. I'm not being unnecessarily pejorative. It's it's just the case, which is one of the reasons why we had so many scandals about them bringing turning them into entertainment centres in a way that if they were Catholics, they would never dream of doing. Um, they put they, they 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 put golf courses in them and. Uh, uh, and, and adult film venues and uh, disco dancing and um, uh, helter skelters. I mean, it's, mm. that, that's what they're doing. Um, so my journey began began then. But um, I think one of the one of the things that's happened to Anglicanism is well, I, sh I should say that many Anglicans deceive themselves by thinking that they have a greater degree of Catholicity than they do in fact have. The Anglican Church is a rather strange uh, hybrid uh, conglomeration of spiritualities woven together by by the by the state for the purposes of the state, and although it contains many quite sincere Christians, uh, it is an it is an imitative organization with no umbilical cord. The umbilical cord was cut on purpose by the reformers. Uh, Queen Elizabeth the first spent a great deal of time executing and torturing priests who came with the Blessed Sacrament to the country. Uh, they were People were fined a year's salary for not appearing at the local Anglican church. They were murdered for going to Mass. Mm -hmm. There is no umbilical cord left during this period. Later on, however, there's what I think I call romantic, a kind of sacramental romantic nostalgia, which began to experience itself by dressing up as, in, as Roman Catholics in Roman Catholic building. And so the Anglo-Catholic movement was born. And then people quite rightly longed for Catholic faith. But they did so within a structure that was inimical to Catholicism. It's the, the 39 Articles call the Mass a, 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 um, a fable, uh, a nonsense. Uh, they forbid it. <laughs> They're very rude about it. So, so the Anglo-Catholic movement, to some extent, is a, is a, is I'm unfortunately it's a, an illusory charade. It's like uh, it's like children dressing up as doctors and nurses and imagining they are doctors and nurses, but they're actually children in costumes. Um, and so there's something of a costume element in this. Well, you can keep this going for a while, and indeed it's been going for about 150 years since the Oxford movement began. Newman saw it through very quickly. And if you like, just to, to give a brief, tiny lecture, <laughs> uh, within Anglican terms, you have Newman and Pusey. Uh, Newman says, this is a charade. I have to become a Roman Catholic. And Pusey says, no, we can keep the charade going. I don't have to be a Roman Catholic. Well, I'm obviously with Newman, but a lot of Anglo-Catholics followed Pusey's uh, wrong advice. But what changed things was the fact that Anglicanism became uh, more progressive and the pretense of being, even the pretense of being an Orthodox Christian community began to be dropped. And it becomes a kind of an example of, of moralistic therapeutic deism only. Uh, and so, you know, feminism grabs hold of it. And then you have women priests, women bishops, gay, gay blessings, gay weddings. Uh, and and the, the point for no return for me was always women bishops, because women priests were sold to people as an experiment. That wasn't true. It was never going to be true. But that's one of the ways in which the faithful were bluffed into imagining there was a discernment process going on. There was nothing of the kind. But for me, any pretense at having a Catholic umbilical cord, which wasn't there anyway, was exploded with women bishops. And that was the moment when I resigned from the Church of England. Uh, and, and so uh, I then took refuge in a form of international uh, Anglicanism, which um, uh, but began in America, the continuing church, so to speak. Um, and one of the reasons I couldn't stay there was I, I, I had the responsibility with some friends of trying to gather together streams of authentic Catholic Anglicanism uh, to, to produce a kind of rearguard fight against progressivism. And I very quickly realized that what we had to do was completely impossible without a magisterium. Only the Catholics had a magisterium. There is, no, there is none in Anglicanism. And so there's no means of getting people to cooperate, even though they think in very similar ways, because you, in the end, you end up with everyone being their own pope. So really, after a short period of time, I realized that, um, uh, that, that, that nothing could be done without the magisterium. And that was probably 
Uh, that and the invitation of the bishop were the two things that made it clear to me that um, I had to change, I had to move from the sinking life raft of Anglicanism to the rescue ship of the Catholic Church. So I noticed you mentioned St. John Henry Newman, and um, he was canonized when you became Catholic in the same year, yes. 2019. Yes, he was. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and he also was probably the most significant scholar regarding the Arian heresy. Yes. And coincidentally, we seem to be suffering from an echo of um, the Arian heresy today and the apostasy that's infiltrated our church. And it's not just a cultural one that's predominant in um, our nations and our governance, but it's also evident in our church today as well. And I was wondering, regarding that, uh, one was, I was wondering about your thinking on that, and also um, regarding your decision to come into the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the things I mentioned to uh, Protestants when I speak with them that are considering it, I let them know that it's great, and I'm all for it. I believe, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is Church of Christ, and but I also let them know that you're volunteering for the front, <laughs> for the front of this war, this a, a war of apostasy that we find ourselves in. So I was wondering what you're thinking about today regarding the condition of the church, and I, I find it somewhat ironic regarding the Arian heresy with uh, St. John Henry Newman. And I, I, I went through his book, The Arians, and um, there's a lot of parallels between the Arian heresy and what we see today. There really are. Well, it's, it's the diminishment. It's a confusion of epistemology and a diminishment of authority, of course, uh, that lies behind both the Arian heresy and the relativism that, Benedict prophesied and warned us about. I mean, St. John Henry Newman had a great effect on me, partly because when I was a new Anglican priest, <clears throat> I, I I didn't know much about him. Uh, and I, in fact, spent about a year and a half with a paperback copy of uh, his Apologia in, in my jacket pocket. I just thought, I've got to read this thing. And I took it everywhere with me. And although I did read it, I didn't understand it. Um, and that's not that's not entirely a reflection on my stupidity, but it's to do with the context. I, you have to put this in context, and I, what I, you know, what I couldn't know then was that forty years later the context uh, would would move, would develop rapidly and change, and then you know, with a changing context, I could understand Newman. Um, so Newman was very important for me. I mean, partly again because he explodes the myth that Anglicanism is a self-standing, authentic uh, part of the branch theory of the church when, again, that's a piece of, of unfounded, untrue romanticism. Um, people have also said to me um, laughingly, well, you've just jumped from the frying pan into the fire <clears throat> and um, so silly old you, why did you, why did you do that? And I say, no, you, you've completely misunderstood. I, I'd been aware for some time. I'd been aware for about twenty-five years of the of cultural Marxism, the threats on our democracy, the threats against freedom of speech, the increasing hatred of our Our Lady against Our Lady and and Our Lord, and um, uh, and it's also been perfectly clear to me that uh, that the whole of Western culture depends upon the Catholic Church. It, it's her child. So when people say you've jumped out of the frying pan from the fire from Anglican to Catholicism, I say, no, not really. I've moved from Dunkirk to the Normandy beaches. Um, you know, Dunkirk was lost. We, we were, the, the, we're, the Anglicanism is completely defeated and, and in retreat. But we're going to retake. You know, this is a fight to the to the end. Uh, and we're, you know, the Normandy beaches was where after a period of regathering. Um, there was a, an attempt to retake the culture. Remember that wonderful phrase by the uh, Cardinal uh, of Chicago, um, whose name I've forgotten, uh, and I really shouldn't have done. Uh, George, Cardinal George, um, mm -hmm. who said, "I'm I'm I'm going to die in my bed. Uh, my successor 
will die in jail. His successor will be martyred, but his successor will play a part in rebuilding civil Christian Christian civilization. Um, and although this was something of an off-the-cuff remark given to a clergy conference, he didn't expect it to become so prophetic or so so, so recorded. Um, I think we have to be in it for the long game and say, well, we're we're halfway between dying in jail and, and dying a martyr's death. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I died in jail. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if I was martyred, uh, should I live another 20 years. Um, but nor will I be surprised when having seen this through, much much as the struggle in so the Soviet Union was seen through. I mean, it took 90 years in the Soviet Union, but I used to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union and theological books for the underground Catholic Church in Prague in the early 80s, so, so priests could be ordained after, after studying because they had no access to the books. Um, and it, it, if you told me that in 1989, freedom and Christianity would return to Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union, I wouldn't believe it. And and that the 20 or five years later, 60 or 70% of Russians would write or identify themselves as Orthodox Christians. I would say, well, this is completely impossible. So this has really happened in our, in our lifetime from the Russian Revolution to 1989. It lasted the most terrible, ruthless, appalling uh, period of, through the period of persecution. <clears throat> and then suddenly the monasteries are full in Russia now. In, in Romania, the monasteries are filling up. Yes. Um, whatever you think about Putin, uh, and you can think what you like about him, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church is has experienced a resurrection, and um, uh, it's absolutely astonishing. Well, maybe we're a generation behind. I mean, we're, we're just about to experience what the Russians went through in 1917. All we can do is be faithful to God in what he's given us and fight for him where we are. But it's not a matter of the frying pan and the fire. It's a matter we're fighting against evil. Evil hates our Lord, hates the church, hates the gospels, hates the sacraments, hates Our Lady. Uh, and that's how we know it's, an, it's, it's a fight against evil, because the very first thing the progressives do is they, they go for the Christians to silence us. Uh, so it's, again, another reason why uh, I didn't think it was right to accept silencing at the hands of the church. Uh, and another reason why I know that we're in a, we're in a spiritual battle to the death and beyond. And um, we just have to be faithful in the place and in the time that God has placed us. Oddly enough, the experience of the Soviet Union is a source of hope for everyone. So you look at the people that were dominated by the Soviet Union, the Catholics, they had nothing. They had no church, they had no mass, they had no priest, but yet the faith remained and the faith lives today. So that's a, a sign of hope, I think, that we have. You know, we could see culturally a de-evolution in Western society and de-Christianization, but the faith is still there. There's very strong pockets of faith, and they're not going to go away. That's the, the promise of our Lord. And also it's the promise of Our Lady, where she says, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. Yes. Yes, that's right. And again, we we have that confidence in the Catholic Church, and it doesn't exist outside the Catholic Church. Well, Dr. Ashenden, I'd like to thank you again for graciously visiting us, and your talk was very informative, and it's much appreciated. And once again, just as a reminder, I'll put the links in the comment section where you can find his work. And I'd like to bid adieu and thank everyone for watching and as always god bless thank you for such an interesting conversation thank you for having me on as a guest it's been a, a very great pleasure and a privilege thank you sir